Uh, welcome everybody to today's uh, Geoscience Australia seminar. It is a special one and I'll speak a little bit about why it's special in a minute, but as part of my welcoming, not only to those that have joined us and particularly those that are from outside of Geoscience Australia, uh, welcome, but I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects on behalf of everyone here to elders past, present and emerging. I'm actually on um, Ghana land at the moment. I'm speaking to you from Adelaide and I realise though that uh, we have people from all over, not only Australia, but the world. And um, I acknowledge traditional owners all around there. I would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in the seminar today. Thank you very much. Well, it's very exciting to introduce today's speaker, Alison Britt, um, but also because Alison is presenting as one of the lectures in not only the Wednesday, our regular Wednesday seminar series, but one of our distinguished Geoscience Australia lectures, and that's otherwise known as a DGAL. And these DGALs are designed to highlight people that have been working with Geoscience Australia for some time and have made some significant contributions through their work that they're sharing with us today as a as really a um, high-end uh, representation of the work that is going on within Geoscience Australia. So a little bit about Alison. Alison <laughs> graduated from the Australian National University uh, with um, honours in 1994 after completing her thesis on the regolith and geochemistry of a copper prospect near Mount Isa. She began her professional career with CSIRO exploration and mining, working on gold geochemistry in the Yulgarn as part of the Cooperative Research Centre for Landscape Evolution and Mineral Exploration, so-called CRC Lean, that I think many of you will know about. This, is, this was followed by six years overseas, working as a share trader, scientific English editor and a contract geologist. Alison then returned to Australia in 2008, initially working with the Uranium Group at Geoscience Australia before moving into mineral resources and advice, specialising in the annual inventory of Australia's mineral resources. More recently, Alison has focused on critical minerals and attracting international minerals investment into Australia. She is currently Geoscience Australia's Acting Director for Mineral Resources Advice and Promotion. That's enough from me. Let's now hear from Alison. Thank you, Alison. Uh, thanks, Steve. And um, I think you've got something to give me, maybe? Well, <laughs> okay, I can do that now. Um, oh, okay. yeah, I was going to do it at the end, but I'll do it now. And, and that is to say that as part of our distinguished Geoscience Australia lectures, we um, like to present um, a little memento to our speakers to mark that. And um, I'll just hand that to you now. Um, here you are, Alison, are you ready? Yep, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Steve. No <laughs> problem. I was thinking you'd forgotten. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Concentrate on your talk now, Alison, okay. all the best. Okay. We're time, to, time to be serious now. So I will just pop up here and share my screen with everybody. And you should have that now. And I think I've got to pop down here, say hide and click that. And hopefully this will work. So thank you, Steve, and good morning to everybody watching online. This collection of internet memes sums up how most of us are probably feeling about 2020. It's been a shocker of a year so far, from catastrophic bushfires, car smashing storms, locusts in Africa, race riots, and a global pandemic that's killing people, causing tension between nations and destroying people's livelihoods. It can seem like the four horsemen of the apocalypse are riding high. But the storm clouds of 2020 have brought us new ways of doing things, Families are spending more time together. People are meeting their neighbours, from a distance, of course, exercising instead of commuting, and dogs have never been so walked. Also, you'd be pretty happy if you own Zoom or Netflix shares. 
The turmoil of 2020 has shown us that what we do, that we do have the ability to do things in new ways. And I suggest that Australia's mining and manufacturing sectors can spearhead Australia's post-COVID recovery, starting with the opportunities to develop a critical mineral sector. Now, I must admit, it's very strange not being able to see you all today, but I will do my best over the next hour to take you on a journey through the world of GSI's Australia's annual, annual flagship publication, Australia's Identified Mineral Resources, in which we release our assessment of 36 major and minor mineral commodities. I will show you what minerals do for us so that pestilence, famine, war and death do not always have the upper hand. How Geoscience Australia's how Geoscience Australia assesses the nation's minerals inventory and contributes to the government's ability to make good policy decisions. And finally, how critical minerals are providing new opportunities that will help Australia and our global trading, global trading partners thrive in a post-pandemic world. So I'll start with some statistics to set the scene. Australia's resources sector contributes a significant portion of our GDP coming in at 10% in 2019. In terms of exports, minerals and energy make up 60% of our export income, with minerals alone contributing almost half. As in previous years, iron ore, like coal, gold, aluminium and copper, contribute the most value, particularly iron ore, which provides 20% of total export income, that is from both goods and services, all by itself. Nickel and the silver lead zinc grouping are also important, but I want to talk about the category labelled other minerals, because I think this is where Australia could potentially make the most difference. That 8% of minerals export income coming from the other category derives from an enormous range of commodities being produced right now in Australia. Here on the periodic table, you can see the blue squares, which represent elements that we produce and have more resources for. The green squares are elements with known resources that are not currently being exploited. And the orange squares represent elements where we do not have defined resources yet, but are actively exploring for based on our understanding of Australia's geological potential. Many of these elements are also regarded as critical minerals, lithium, cobalt and rare earths, for example. And you can see these in the red letters. Australians would be so much the poorer without our ability to mine such a wide range of elements. So it made me wonder, just how much of our minerals exports, just how much our mineral exports mean to us as individual Australians. So the green line is our population growth from around 17 million people in 1990 to more than 25 million in 2020. This is an increase of almost 50% over 30 years. Now compare the population increase to the massive 270% increase in resources income per capita over the same time period. And I have adjusted the minerals and energy export income to $2019, so this increase is real. Now, the average Australian does not own a mining company, except through our super funds, perhaps. But a 2019 report by Deloitte leads me to estimate that for every export dollar Australia earns from minerals, energy and state governments, uh, from minerals, federal and state governments receive around 10 cents in taxes and royalties. In addition, the uplifting effects of employment and economic activity in our regional areas also improves the lives of Australians. So this is really great stuff, but what does it have to do with the four men of the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Who were they anyway? So the four horsemen appear in a number of books in the Bible. The most famous, of course, is Revelations, but also Zechariah, Ezekiel and Daniel and they appear in literary and pop culture through the ages, including the very amusing Good Omens on Amazon Prime, starring David Tennant and Michael Sheen, one that my family very much enjoyed. Consequently, there are a number of names for the horsemen, which I've listed on the slide. The first horseman seems to be the one that's most open to interpretation, but not so much the last horseman, unfortunately. So for the purposes of this talk, I've taken some poetic license and will label them pestilence, war, famine and death. And I'd like to show how the technologies that we have been able to create using minerals can help prevent the disasters these horsemen represent and drive the global advancements needed to make people's lives better on a cleaner and environmentally robust planet Earth. So in the Good Omen series that I mentioned before, pestilence retired with the invention of penicillin and was replaced by pollution. 
Now, pollution is a great idea for an apocalyptic horseman, and one in which the world can definitely take on by using minerals such as lithium, cobalt, graphite and rare earths, which are all used in the renewable energy technologies that are reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. But unfortunately, 2020 has shown us that pestilence is still consulting. And while we do not yet have a vaccine or cure for COVID-19, minerals play a major part in modern medicine and have enabled us to have the longest average lifespans in recorded history. There's the obvious iron and aluminium in the beds, trolleys and machineries, and the lights use rare earth elements. But did you know that modern medicinal treatments themselves use a very wide range of minerals? For an MRI scan, you will be injected with gadolinium. Titanium is the only metal that the human body does not reject, so it's used in joint replacements. And erbium is used in medical lasers for skin resurfacing procedures. Like the other rare earths, it has no known biological function in the body, but if it is there, it's probably being stored in your bones. And when we finally have a vaccine for COVID, it might contain aluminium, which is commonly used in tiny amounts to increase the effectiveness of vaccines by strengthening the immune response. So take that pestilence. The second horseman is war. And from the dawn of humanity, the tribes with the best minerals technology had the advantage. Stone defeats wood, copper defeats stone. Copper defeats wood, copper defeats stone. Bronze defeats copper, iron defeats bronze, and steel is superior to iron. Modern defence technologies use a huge range of minerals and the US Department of Defence alone uses nearly 750,000 tonnes of minerals each year. For example, about 80% of an aeroplane is made from aluminium, as it is both lightweight and strong. Rhenium is added to jet engines so that they can burn hotter and fly faster. And beryllium's heat conducting properties make it an ideal component of surveillance technology the kind that detects improvised explosive devices or minefields. The control of mineral supply chains is also important for taking on the horsemen of war. Countries with some kind of minerals dominance, whether resources or in downstream processing, can and do use their advantage for trade and territorial disputes. As far back as 432 BC, Athens imposed trade sanctions on Megara to weaken that city-state's ability to aid Sparta, the great enemy of Athens. Recent examples of the rare earths embargo imposed by China. Uh, recent examples of the rare earths embargo imposed by China on Japan in 2010, and going further back, at the deadly conflict of the Second World War. Now, at the risk of invoking Godwin's law, far too early in my talk, I'm going to talk about the Second World War and how one critical mineral, or the lack of it, helped defeat Nazi Germany. Wolfram is the old word for tungsten. And tungsten and tungsten alloys have a very high shock tolerance and shatter resistance, along with high melting and boiling points. Thus, tungsten is an absolutely vital ingredient for armour piercing shells, tanks, and other war machinery. Prior to World War I, Germany had acquired its tungsten from Wales, and during that war, from Portugal and Spain. Between the wars, it built up its supplies from China, which at the time provided more than one third of the world's tungsten. Other significant tungsten producers at the time were Burma and the USA, but smaller amounts could also be bought from Bolivia, British Malaya, Portugal, Japan, Australia, Argentina, Indochina, Spain and the UK. Clearly, a very diversified supply chain that served the Allied forces well when World War II broke out. With Japan occupying the Korean Peninsula and Manchuria, China had been buying weapons and machinery from Germany in exchange for tungsten. But when the Second Sino-Japanese War broke out in 1937, Germany sided with Japan, with the idea being that Japan would continue to supply Chinese tungsten to Germany when they had occupied the tungsten producing areas. China, funnily enough, stopped supplying Germany with tungsten. With China cut off and its three year stockpile of tungsten depleting as World War II dragged on, Germany became reliant on imports from Portugal and Spain. So the Allied forces engaged in economic warfare. Portugal had claimed neutrality and at the start of the war would sell to anyone. So the UK tried to buy as much Portuguese tungsten as possible, which sent both prices and production skyrocketing. Later, when Portugal tried to assert its neutrality with German trade agreements, the Allied forces withheld oil imports. Spain, under Franco, 
had not so much desired neutrality, but had been forced into it. Like Portugal, Spain was reliant on oil imports from the US. In exchange for oil, Spain was required to be neutral and cease supply of tungsten to Germany, although much of it was still smuggled out. But the upshot is that from 1943, the Nazis were forced to use less tungsten, and while they never ran out completely, the lack of tungsten and other critical minerals was an important factor in their defeat. The Allies, with their well-developed and diverse supply chains, were never short of tungsten, and with all the purchases, even had a surplus. Later in the talk, I'll explore more about this idea as it pertains to critical minerals like tungsten and the importance of diverse and reliable supply chains as a matter of national and commercial security. The third horseman is famine, and our knowledge of of an ability to use minerals has helped produce the incidence of famine in the modern era, which is particularly important now, given the record number of people alive. At the risk of stating the obvious, humans and every other life form on the planet are made of elements, and we need a wide range of elements to sustain life, even if only in trace amounts. Iron, for example, only makes up 0.1% of the atoms in our body, but can you imagine how anemic or rather dead we'd all be without the haemoglobin in our blood? We get most minerals from our food, both vegetable and animal, and some through the water we drink. But to feed 7 billion people, we need healthy soils that provide all the minerals needed by our crops and animals. Without fertile soil, the crops and animals that live on them cannot grow to their full potential. Plants need phosphorus, potassium and nitrogen to grow. And for phosphorus, there is no substitute available. In addition, Plants need varying amounts of sulphur, magnesium, calcium, copper, manganese, selenium, zinc, iron and boron, just to name a few. Humans are now very good at making fertilisers tailored to different types of crops and soils, resulting in increased agricultural yields and increased food security. We also need minerals for agricultural machinery and infrastructure, including dams, irrigation systems and access to groundwater. And our food processing factories are also largely comprised of minerals, with computers, robotics and automated systems made possible by critical minerals. We should also not forget our modern transport and communication systems for food distribution. Again, these run on minerals technologies. The third horseman is losing this war. Since the start of the industrial age, famines have decreased both in frequency and geographic area, with the vast majority occurring due to wars and other political decisions, rather than the mechanics of growing food. Well, there's no escaping death, obviously, but we can certainly delay the inevitable for most people. And I think the previous slides have demonstrated just how well modern technology has helped the human condition. In the book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, evolutionary psychologist Steven Pinker explains how, over the long term, violence and early death in human society have declined. He postulates a number of reasons for this, unexpected things such as the invention of the novel, but also the rise of nation states and the role of commerce in making people more valuable alive than dead. And I'd also add to that list our capacity for invention and the ability to mine and use the raw materials around us for new technologies leading to longer lives, particularly since the start of the industrial age and the discovery and development of nitrate, potash and phosphate fertilisers. And these have played a significant part in leading to today's long lifespans. So now we know just how important minerals are to human life and how we can use them to take on the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It's, pretty, it's fairly self-explanatory why we would want to know exactly what Australia's Minerals Endowment is, but how do we do this? Well, as luminaries such as Peter, Peter Drucker and Lloyd Kelvin have explained, you measure and provide a number. Only then can you manage and improve. So how does Geoscience Australia measure the nation's Minerals Endowment and produce the numbers each year for Australia's Identified Mineral Resources, our flagship publication of the last 44 years? Well, for a start, you need to recognise that mineral resources come in a wide variety of geological settings and mineralisation styles. It is impossible to measure, in the strict sense of the word, the quantities of an element in the ground unless you dig it all up and analyse every gram. So, more correctly, a resource geologist provides an estimate of the likely resource in terms of how certain he or she is about the quantity of ore and its likely commerciality. That second part of the equation is important because a resource is really only a resource if you can exploit it for gain. 
Otherwise, even seawater, with its trace amounts of everything, would be regarded as an ore body. Once you have a resource estimate, you need to be able to describe that estimate. In 1976, the United States Geological Survey and the United States Bureau of Mines jointly published a mineral resource classification system, which is now widely known as the McKelvey system, named after resources geologist Vincent McKelvey, who was director of the USGS 1971 to 1977. It has two axes. The first shows increasing confidence in the geological certainty of the resource. And the second axis shows increasing confidence in its economic viability. In Australia, Geoscience Australia, and its predecessors have used a version of the McKelvey system since 1976 called the National Classification System for Identified Mineral Resources, and it covers the field shaded blue. Also in Australia, mining companies have reported to the ASX since 1989 using the JORC code. You will note that the JORC code only covers the economic field of identified resources, and that is an important distinction from the government classification system. Let me explain. Now, the owl-eared amongst you will note that I previously said that a resource is only a resource if you can exploit it for gain. You'll also note that I said gain and not profit, because in some circumstances, an entity might choose to mine for strategic reasons rather than economic ones. For example, guano was sporadically mined from the Ashford, Ashford Caves in northern New South Wales from 1916 to 1967. It wasn't a particularly great source of phosphorus, only around 10% concentration, but the phosphate deposits of the Georgina Basin hadn't been discovered yet, and with Christmas Island and Nauru occupied by the Japanese in World War II, Australia needed to mine phosphate from caves such as Ashford to provide the fertiliser needed to grow the crops to feed the nation. Another reason to assess sub-economic resources is to understand why they are sub-economic in case there's something you can do to change this. For example, some deposits may contain critical minerals, shown in red on the slide. They're not commercial now, but perhaps could be with government policies that support processing, innovation and infrastructure development. Australia has many sub-economic resources, including the massive rare earths deposit at Olympic Dam that currently can't be processed economically. Thus, it's important for governments to understand both economic and sub-economic resource potential. So we've seen that the national classification system is based on the Kelby system and was in fact adopted by Geoscience Australia's predecessor organisation, the Bureau of Mineral Resources, shortly after the USGS published in 1976. This is why Australia has more than 40 years of continuous records of mineral resource estimates. However, from time to time, the national classification system has been reviewed and updated, with an important review occurring in 1983, where the BMR changed its usage of the term reserves. Now, if I flip back to the McKelvey diagram, you'll see the word reserve is used in all kinds of interesting ways, inferred reserve and marginal reserve, for example. In Australia, the BMR decided that the term was too prone to misunderstanding and thus eliminated it from the national classification system altogether. These days, the word reserve is used in Australia in the technical sense, only by the JORC code. And the term has a very specific and defined meaning. It is only used for estimates of the utmost geological economic certainty, which is a far cry from the more generic usage in the USGS system and elsewhere. In the national classification system, the highest category is economic demonstrated resources, or EDR for short. It includes job reserves, but is much broader as it is used for long-term regional and national assessments, not for the commercial prospects of individual mines. The JORC code is used for individual mines as a reporting code to inform share owners and prospective investors of material matters pertaining to a company and its resource assets. It became mandatory to use the JORC code to report, to report resource estimates to the Australian Securities Exchange and the New Zealand Stock Exchange in 1989 and is in fact part of listing rules. It's not a prescriptive code but rather is based on the three principles of materiality, competence and transparency. Since 1989, there have been a number of revisions, with the current version in use being JORC 2012. 
A new update is underway for 2020, and as each update has historically brought new transparency and information to stakeholders. I, for one, am looking forward to the most recent developments and the increased confidence we can in using JORC assessments for assessing Australia's identified mineral resources. Now, if I haven't lost you in the technicalities, and you find that mineral classification systems at all interesting, you might be asking how it all works in practice. So let me explain the basics. When we have a new resource estimate in front of us, the first question we ask is, is the mineral resource geologically demonstrated? In JORC parlance, this would be, is the resource measured or indicated? If the answer is no, then the estimate is put into the inferred category and we make no economic judgment about it. Inferred is the lowest category of certainty. It tells you that there's something there that could turn into something, but there simply isn't enough geological information for mine planning. I've even heard it said that at the inferred stage, the estimate could be up to 80% wrong in either direction. If the answer is yes, the resource is geologically demonstrated. Um, sorry, I just lost myself there. Uh, if the answer is yes, the resource is geologically demonstrated, then we ask an economic question. Has this resource been shown to be commercial or assumed to be so with reasonable certainty? In other words, is it in play under current economic conditions or those of the foreseeable future? If the answer is no, the estimate is put into the sub-economic category. We rarely do this with JOR compliant estimates because there are no sub-economic categories under the JOR code. But from time to time, some resource estimates need to be reassessed and moved into this field. If the answer is yes, then we can ask another question. Do we consider all of the demonstrated resource to be available for mining over the long term? If yes, the estimate is placed in the economic category. If no, then we can split the resource between the economic and sub-economic categories according to its recoverability and mine plan. But this is very difficult to do if companies do not report this information. So where do the resource estimates come from? For the most part, Geoscience Australia relies heavily on the public reports made by industry to the ASX using the job code. We also include estimates made using other reporting codes and receive a number of confidential reports each year. Because the national classification system predates JORC, we also have a small number of historical reports and GA estimates. The biggest limitation to accurate assessments is the lack of mandatory reporting from private and foreign owned companies. So all up, our annual assessments have resulted in a database with more than 40 years of data covering almost 4,500 mineral deposits with nearly 10,000 individual mineralised zones more than 300 operating mines. It will not surprise you to learn that this database has been described as a national treasure. Now sometimes I'm asked why the top economic category in the national classification system is so broad? Why don't we just use dual compliant ore reserves, which after all have been shown to be economic, whereas mission indicated resources probably won't all be mined even at active mines. It's because the Australian government needs to know about the long-term outlook for potential mineral supply. And ore reserves alone can only give us a short-term outlook. But we consider it reasonable to include measured and indicated resource estimates in the top economic category. Because we know that as ore reserves are depleted, mining companies upgrade measured and indicated resources to all reserves and in turn upgrade inferred resources to measured and indicated. In addition, new drilling adds to the resources inventory. So while this reasoning might not work for every individual mine on a national scale, it does make sense to regard agglomerated measured and indicated mineral resources as economic over the long term. I'll show you what I mean on the next slide. If we go back to 1998, we thought we had economic resources amounting to 4,403 tonnes of gold in the ground. And that year, Australia mined about 300 tonnes of it. Since 1998, 
All of that EDR has been mined out and then some. Yet we have not run out of gold. In fact, today's EDR are at record levels. If I add in the cumulative amount of gold that has been mined since each year on this chart, you will see that we have mined an astonishing 50 times the amount of gold that had been identified as economic back in 1975. In addition, this chart shows that our measurements of Australia's gold inventory can show us trends over time. For each of the 36 minerals in Australia's identified mineral resources, we can compare resources, production, expiration and price trends to get a national assessment of that mineral. The next few slides will demonstrate the interconnectedness of these trends in price, exploration, resource discovery, construction, production and resource life. And these relationships are important for helping to determine how Australia might supply mineral resources into the future. Now this slide and the next two are presented ice core style, where we have the time series running vertically rather than the usual left to right across the screen. Iron ore tells a story of increased demand from China, driving an exploration boom, which resulted in new hematite and magnetite resources being delineated. At the same time, capital poured into Western Australia, and it was this construction boom that drove increased production. We see a similar story for coal, with increased demand from China driving prices steeply upward in 2006, which then stimulated exploration, leading to the delineation of additional resources, temporarily reversing the decline in resource life. These increases in price, exploration and EDR coincided with construction and expansions that began around the turn of this century, resulting in both increasing resources and increased production. Lower prices post-global financial crisis have dampened exploration and once again resource life is declining, which all sounds quite dire until you know that Australia's resources of black coal are massive and at today's production rates we have more than a century of mining left. Now the previous slides for bulk commodities both show coincident exploration and construction booms over the last decade or so that have resulted in increased resources and production for iron ore and black coal. However, the pattern is slightly different for gold. A surge in the gold price for around 2006, which also weathered the global financial crisis, resulted in rapidly increased resource delineation. Production, however, did not increase as rapidly as gold projects were not as successful as iron and coal projects at attracting the finite pool of investment dollars at this time. At one stage, Geoscience Australia was even told that its resource assessment showing increasing EDR must be wrong because production hadn't increased. These days, global uncertainties have made gold one of the most attractive commodities on the market, as people see it as a safe haven for investment. The sustained interest of the past five years has led to record prices, record exploration expenditure, and large tonnages of inferred resources being upgraded just in the last year alone, and now also record gold production. Now the previous three ice core style slides for iron or coal and, and coal and gold had a graph for resource life. But what is resource life and how is it determined? Firstly, you need to know that in general, some reserve or resource estimate, R, is divided by some production number, P, R or B. That P may be annual production, or a five-year average, or even a projected production. The resulting ratio is only a snapshot in time. So why bother? Well, these ratios can be useful for determining general trends or highlighting deviations from the trend. What's important to realise is that so-called resource life or reserve life can be incredibly variable because resource estimates and production vary from year to year, month to month. I liken it to a football game where not only are the players and ball moving, but the goalposts and field as well. The second thing you need to keep in mind when thinking about resource life is that mineral reserves and resources are not supply. They only provide opportunity for supply. They support a possible future rate of production. Svartan Dyke's fable shows how estimating resource life for mineral commodities can be a fraught exercise. So keeping that in mind, the next slide 
shows the wide range of possible reserve and resource lives that can be applied to different minerals. Reserve life at operating mines in Australia is less than 15 years for some commodities, but we know that mining companies replace depleted ore by upgrading measured and indicated resources. Thus, resource life at operating mines, seen in the second column, is considerably larger than reserve life, except for diamonds, which are not looking too healthy at all with the imminent closure of the Argyle mine. A yet larger, longer term view of resource life can be derived by using accessible EDR. And if we use all identified mineral resources, Australia has the potential to supply major commodities to the world for centuries, with the exception of gold and diamonds which have a significantly shorter future. The data assessments behind Australia's identified mineral resources also enable us to study the distribution of mineral resources in Australia. Most of the geologists at GA would be used to looking at mineralisation from a geological and geophysical point of view. After all, we would like to understand the mineral system that created the deposit so we can find more. But from a policy perspective, there are other ways of looking at resource distribution, and I have listed some examples on the slide. Each method shows a lot, shines a light on the various strengths and vulnerabilities for each individual commodity, but in the interest of time, I'll just show you a few examples. In Australia, mineral rights belong to the states, and as such, it can be an interesting exercise to see how the different commodities are spread across the country. Some commodities, such as iron ore and nickel, are dominated by single jurisdictions. Some states owe their share of resources to just one or two deposits, but other commodities are more geographically dispersed, with gold in particular shared by every jurisdiction. Critical minerals are similarly diverse in their state locations. Western Australia has the lion's share of lithium, with a small percentage in the Northern Territory at the Finnis deposit. It's worth noting, though, that Finnis is still regarded as a significant developing project. Many of the jurisdictions hold significant percentages of zirconium and rare earths, and interestingly, the same is true for cobalt. It's interesting because all, co all cobalt production in Australia currently comes from nickel mines. And if you remember the previous slide, Western Australia absolutely dominates nickel resources. But since cobalt is also, association, is also associated with copper deposits, which are more evenly distributed across the jurisdictions, we are seeing potential opportunities for alternative supply of cobalt. Now, with the hard border closures we've been experiencing lately, more diverse sources of production can only be a good thing. I also find it interesting to look at the distribution of economic resources by the actual deposits. This horribly busy chart shows the top 40 deposits for a few of our major commodities. But just by looking at the bars, you can immediately see an obvious difference between coal and the metal commodities. The top 40 coal deposits each contribute just a few percent to EDR, which is in stark contrast to the metals, which are dominated by just a few mines. If a disaster were to befall one of our major coal mines, it would not impact on future potential supply in the same way as if a disaster were to befall Olympic Dam, Huntley, Cadia or Hamsley Iron. The metals tend to be dominated by a few world-class deposits that have attracted the funding necessary for development, and this has resulted in much of Australia's minerals inventory being attributable to a relatively small number of deposits. For some commodities, distribution by geological type is also important. For gold, the overall ratio of accessible EDR to production in 2018 is some 30 years. However, this number does not tell you how much of the gold, how much of gold's outlook is actually influenced by the type of gold deposit. In this diagram, you can see that copper gold deposits make up two thirds of Australia's total economic resources. Yet it is the low to gold deposits, which are often small to medium sized operations that are the powerhouse producers of gold in Australia. In 2018, they supplied 69% of Australia's total gold production, yet comprise only 31% of resources. So if you were to determine resource life by geological type, you would find that resource to production ratio for the low gold deposits is only 22 years. And if these deposits were depleted, it's unlikely that the already large operations of Olympic Dam, Acadia or Boddington could rapidly increase production to offset lost low gold production. 
My last point on mineral resource distribution is that Australia's identified mineral resources reveals that this country has some of the largest known mineral resources in the world, which places us as a very attractive destination for exploration. We are also a major producer for many minerals, but as discussed previously, much of our production and much of our EDR is attributable to a relatively small number of major deposits. If we are to meet future minerals demand and develop more resilient supply chains, then programs such as Exploring for the Future are vital for aiding the discovery of the next generation of ore deposits, including those for critical minerals. When one of my old bosses retired from the Mineral Resources and Advice team at GA, he said to me, Alison, at some stage in your career, rather than resourcing you properly, the powers that be will suggest that GA stops covering the minor commodities and just concentrates <clears throat> on the major ones that bring in the bulk of Australia's income. Now, the problem with that is that these minor commodities always come back into fashion and then you'll be scrambling when the minister calls. Now, my old boss was right about the minor commodities becoming fashionable again but he did not predict that they would all come back into fashion at the same time. At GA, in our annual assessments of 36 mineral commodities, we have always covered critical minerals. It's just that they weren't called that. So I want to touch on this term and explain why some minerals are regarded as critical and why they are an important topic in recent years. For a mineral to be considered critical, it must fulfil two criteria. One, that's essential for modern technology and cannot be easily substituted with a different mineral. And two, there is a risk that the supply of that mineral could be disrupted. So a mineral like copper, for example, is essential for electricity distribution, but raw and processed copper can be sourced from many places around the world. So while it meets the first criterion, it's not critical because it doesn't meet the second. Similarly, the closure of the Argyle mine in Western Australia will strongly disrupt the global supply of pink diamonds. But while the diamonds are gorgeous, the world will keep humming along without them. So again, not critical. Minerals like cobalt and tantalum, however, do meet both criteria. They are crucial for modern battery and capacitated technologies and global resources, if not supply, are dominated by Central Africa, where they are classified as conflict minerals. Thus, they tick the boxes for both criteria and are considered critical. Australia has classified 24 commodities as critical minerals, as listed in Australia's Critical Minerals, uh, critical minerals Strategy 2019. This publication is available online and a simple search using the title should bring it up in your web browser. The 24 minerals are based on a combination of the critical minerals identified by our partner countries and our own nation's geological prospectivity for those minerals. This is a dynamic list that may change as the understanding of Australia's resource potential develops and as, de and as demand for critical minerals changes in response to technological and market developments. This pile of coloured spaghetti is actually a pretty awesome diagram once you get over the visual shock of it and start studying the different strands. It was recently published by the European Commission and shows just how much modern technologies rely on a broad range of traditional and specialty mineral elements for everyday life. The EU is keen on developing a circular economy where materials are recycled as much as possible but they recognise that even if they were able to develop 100% recycling efficiency overnight, the growth in technology uptake for electric vehicles, battery storage, renewable energy generation and supporting infrastructure, just for starters, will require primary additions from mining. And these are the kinds of numbers we're talking about. Already, we have seen massive increases in demand for the minerals needed for battery minerals, with this slide showing the increase in production from 2000 to 2019. Production has basically gone nuts for cobalt and lithium, doubled for manganese, rare earths and nickel, almost doubled for graphite, and is considerably up for vanadium and copper. On the subject of copper, our cities are also growing. And traditional metals such as copper, iron ore, coal, aluminium, lead, zinc and tin will also be needed in the future in increasing amounts, not just critical minerals. Production of these major minerals has also been growing significantly over the last two decades. More slowly than the battery minerals perhaps, but with more stable growth. Copper is expected to experience faster growth going forward as structural changes work their way through our economies. 
For instance, twice as much copper is needed in a hybrid car than a petrol car, and three times as much copper is needed in fully electric cars, and that does not account for all the new charging infrastructure needed for electric vehicles, which will require more copper again. In fact, it's predicted in fact, it's predicted that over the next two to three decades, the world will consume as much copper as it has in all of history to date. We see similar trends for most mineral commodities, not just copper. This recognition of growing minerals needs is not just in Europe either, but is global. In May this year, the World Bank published an energy study showing huge demand for a broad range of minerals needed for a decarbonised economy by 2050. By 2050. As we saw in one of the previous slides, Australia has either large resources of or large potential for all of the minerals on this chart. In addition, Australia is already a world leading producer for 11 of the 17 elements listed. Graphite, however, is not something that Australia produces yet. It is a fundamental component of lithium ion batteries used for energy storage, but its processing, which is a very dirty job, is dominated by China. Australia does, however, have graphite deposits, which are now under, develop, under development, including new processing technologies that will have far less impact on the environment. This last point is important because as much as nations and companies recognise their growing need for raw materials, there is a concurrent push for responsibly produced commodities. One fund manager in New York told us earlier this year that she would not invest in a mining company that did not have the credentials for responsible mining and development because it would be putting her insurance company investments at risk. Apart from the challenges of sourcing responsibly produced commodities, Another problem for many countries is that they are reliant on imports and thus vulnerable if supply is disrupted. This Pac-Man slide shows the near monopolies some countries have on the production of critical minerals. But in today's modern world of interconnected free market economies, does anyone actually use their market dominance to disadvantage others? Surely the mighty dollar rules and people put their own commercial self-interest first. While this thinking might have dominated over the last few decades as world markets have become increasingly globalised, the answer is yes. Yes, people do use market dominance for strategic advantage. Not all markets are free and trade sanctions have been around for a very long time to varying degrees of success and remain an integral component of the foreign policy of most nation states. In recent years, rare earth elements have been dominating media discussions about critical minerals and supply. China dominates production of both the raw material and downstream processing. This was the situation in 2019 as illustrated by Linus. Ten years ago, however, there were far fewer flags represented along the supply chain. But in 2010, China announced an embargo on rare earth exports, citing environmental concerns. Now this hurt China's customers, but it also spurred investment in mines outside of China, resulting in today's reduced Chinese market share. However, China's ability to control the market with cheap rare earths has stymied the development of many new, new rare earth projects outside of that country. And so it still dominates production with an estimated 63% share of mine, of mine production in 2019 and more for processing. The 2010 embargo was lifted when the World Trade Organization ruled against it, but since then China has used its rare earths new monopoly in disputes with Japan and the USA, which is of concern for many other countries as well. In fact, the USA deems the lack of diverse supply of rare earths a national security risk and has been actively engaging with Australia and other countries to develop solutions. Given our mint endowment and mining know-how, I think the future for Australia's critical mineral sector is full of possibility, but new mines will need new investment, much of it foreign, as we don't have enough domestic capital to do it all ourselves. In addition, COVID-19 has shown us how fragile some of the global supply chains are, and I suggest that there has never been a better time for Australia to improve its share of downstream value adding. And this, but this will need innovation in processing technologies, as well as new infrastructure to support development, all of which is described in Australia's National Action Plan. And GA is helping 
the Critical Illness Facilitation Office coordinate these national actions and work with other countries who also wish to increase the resilience of their critical mineral supply chains. Countries such as India, Japan, Korea and the EU and the UK are looking to Australia to provide new opportunities. Australia's most mature critical minerals partnership is with the United States. In early 2018, the USA and Australia agreed to work together and shortly after, Geoscience Australia and the United States Geological Survey were joined by the Canadian Geological Survey. The three organisations have been working closely together on a number of initiatives to strengthen our critical minerals resilience. In particular, we have created the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative which provides a structure for the collaboration. Our goals are to promote critical minerals discovery in all three countries by developing a better understanding of the critical mineral content in Australia and Australian and North American ore bodies, to understand critical minerals byproduct opportunities, and to identify new sources of supply through critical minerals potential mapping. We recently published a fact sheet that summarises the initiative and activities, and one of the projects that I'm excited about seeks to identify unreported or overlooked mineral resources based on the known geochemical associations between major and minor, minor minerals in different mineral systems. If this work bears fruit, we could end up with two publications each year, Australia's Identified Mineral Resources and Australia's Extrapolated Mineral Resources, and that could be a game changer for governments and companies. So GA's flagship publication, Australia's Identified Mineral Resources, helps us understand our resource base and resource potential for those minerals deemed critical, such as cobalt, lithium and rare earth elements, and also for those commodities that already have resilient supply chains, such as the more traditional metals like nickel, copper and zinc. All of our mineral resources will be vitally important in taking on the four horsemen of the apocalypse in these unprecedented and challenging times. With our minerals industry spearheading the post pandemic recovery. And as I come to an end, as I come to the end of my presentation today, I want to acknowledge the members of the Minerals Resources Advice and Promotion section. It takes a massive team effort to cover 36 mineral commodities, provide advice to a wide range of stakeholders from the general public to other public service departments to the government of the day, and to promote our minerals opportunities and pre-competitive data to investors and explorers around the world. In addition, people from outside our immediate section also make a significant contribution, and GA simply could not provide the high quality advice and expertise that it does day in and day out without the participation of these other sections. Now, my husband once told me that I have the most boring job in Geoscience Australia, but if you've thought that the last hour has been interesting, then please let me know. Just as many people from outside the immediate MRAP section make a contribution to assessing Australia's identified mineral resources, there may be a way for you to help with this important work too so that we can continue to use our minerals knowledge to take on the four horsemen of the apocalypse and make our lives healthier, wealthier and safer on an environmentally robust planet Earth. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much there, Alison. That was excellent. And there's been already a vote of thanks from Joe Kakuza thanking you and saying how very informative you found your presentation. Um, I just wanted to make everyone aware that if you do have any questions, oh, now everyone else is rushing <laughs> to, to say congratulations because I mentioned Joe. But anyhow, um, terrific to see people obviously got a lot out of that and enjoyed it. Um, but I do also encourage that if people do have questions, if they could um, enter them onto the chat line and um, I'll do my best to try to cover at least one or two of them. Just while we're waiting for perhaps a, another question, Alison, I've, I've got one for you. Yeah. Um, I think you've made a really good point that Australia has a lot of opportunity and potential with the current COVID situation to lead a recovery or spearhead a recovery, I think was the word mm. you used. Have you got any um, thoughts, have you had any thoughts about some specific either actions that we could be doing to um, enhance that or particular commodities that um, might change because of the COVID situation? 
I would say, let me think about that. Um, it's an important part of the job to try to predict um, the way technologies are going so that we can make sure that we're on top of what minerals are going to be needed, which is one of the reasons that we do cover such a broad range. You, as my previous boss said, you never know when that mineral will become important again. So I don't really like playing favourites in that sense. So I like keeping an eye on them all. But that said, I've, I've got a soft spot for scandium because um, it's such a useful mineral, but it's one of those chicken and egg situations where there's a lot of technologies that could use scandium and be more efficient because of that, that scandium component, but they don't include it because they can't get a hold of scandium. So it's it's one of those chicken and egg situations where if you had scandium, would more people use it and therefore create a market for it? Um, rare earths are obviously always going to be um, useful and um, the electric vehicle, um, the growth in electric vehicles, cobalt, is, is absolutely critical as well. Though because that's been difficult to get a hold of sometimes, companies are looking at ways to substitute cobalt out of the batteries. And that's something we've got to watch out for as well. But if Australia has readily available cobalt, well, why would you bother substituting it out if you can get a hold of it? So, so things like that. Yeah, no, that's great. It, I, I guess only time will tell and um, we're still, in, you know, a lot of these things are still playing out. So it'll be oh, interesting absolutely. to see how that goes. Absolutely. Um, we've got a question from Anna Pitts, who's also in Adelaide, um, and she wants to know, if you have any comment about how much work is being done to recover critical minerals from waste or refuse. Mm. Okay, so this is something that's come on to the, the agenda in recent years. Um, so at Geoscience Australia, we've just done a preliminary study on this. Um, it's it's something we'd like to look at further, but um, you know everything has to be balanced with resource issues, etc. Um, the Queenslanders have a quite a um, advanced project looking at that work. And uh, their Sustainable Mining Institute up at uh, UQ um, is heavily into that as well. So work is being done in this field, but it's nascent. And it really does provide enormous opportunities because we know that some, some places, I mean, not just for critical minerals, but for normal ones as well, some places they have recoverability rates of less than 50%. There's all this stuff in the tailings. And if you can recover your tailings, recover minerals from tailings, make a buck, and put back cleaner tailings, that's got to be a good thing, right? So um, a, a new area that we're looking at and um, something that I hope we do get to do more on. Yeah, excellent. Actually, that's taken us pretty much up, up to time. I guess the um, the horses have bolted. Oh, boy, I'm on a roll there. Um, <laughs> just want to thank you again, Anna. Um, and also, I've, um, I want to promote to the, particularly those that are coming from outside of GA that this seminar series is something that we've been running every Wednesday. And I encourage you to keep an eye on um, upcoming talks and, and to register. Um, but just a little bit of a plug for next week, um, we've got another distinguished GA lecturer, and um, that's Ella uh, Matlenko, and she's presenting on. Uh, Ella's, sorry, Ella's presenting on the Copernicus Australasia Regional Data Hub, Australia's role in the Eurovision of satellites. That's fantastic. <laughs> so um, certainly been a lot of interest in our Earth observation and, and the use of Copernicus uh, data. So it'd be great to hear a lot more about that. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and particularly thank you, Alison. Um, and my family thanks you because I've got a few dad jokes out of my system. <laughs> <laughs> See you all next week. Bye. All right. Thank you, everybody.